Hi, I'm Lee Barris, and I've been a commercial photographer for over 40 years. Most of my career has been spent in the entertainment industry doing photography for print advertising. And I'm going to show you a few images just to give you an idea of my background in photography before we dive into my presentation on shooting and processing panoramas. I've been shooting for movie posters for a while now, and this is perhaps my most famous poster. I won a key art award for this, but the only thing I photographed was the moth. Just a little bit of trivia surrounding this image. The markings on the back of this death's head moth are actually a kind of homage to Salvador Dali. The skull is actually made up of nude figures. Now, originally, these were actual nudes shot by Kevin Stapleton. But the MPAA, the censor board for the movie industry, would not allow nudes to be on a movie poster. Really. This little skull is about the size of my thumbnail on the poster. But, okay, so the agency responsible for the design retouched some hemlines around the necks for the bodysuits the women were wearing. So now you know bodysuits is code for butt naked. My specialty for movie posters was photographing body doubles and combining these with the headshots of the movie stars. This one was quite a Frankenstein job. The figure is made up from four different shots, including Angelina Jolie's head. The body double was chosen for her athletic ability, but in the end, we had to use Angelina's boobs for the final composite. This was a body double shoot. When Tim Robbins saw the poster, he asked his agent if his feet really were that big. The blue eye here was the very first digitally captured image on a movie poster. This was 1993. In the beginning, digital capture was not considered high res enough for movie posters. I was commissioned to shoot the eye when Paramount realized that the eye they had been using was Michelle Pfeiffer's, and she's not in the movie. They needed a replacement immediately because the poster was going to press. I shot the eye, turning the job around in about three hours total. They had to blur it and add considerable noise to make it match the 35 millimeter slides that were used for the other images. After this, digital started to become much more popular and I pretty much stopped shooting film. This is my 15 minutes of fame. I was the body double for Harrison Ford in this poster. I was also the semi-official photographer of the Enterprise in the Star Trek movie posters, from the original cast movies through the next generation. If you see a picture of the Enterprise in a movie poster, it was something that I shot. I also did digital image compositing for magazines, and this was one of my most famous projects. I did the compositing of the chimpanzees in this image for National Geographic. These were all shots of one chimp named Archie shot by Louis Sahoyas in my studio for the October 1991 issue. I assembled all the shots into a background shot of a Boston Law Library, utilizing some prototype models of a futuristic Apple computer that would later turn into the iMac. We had all the chimps typing out simian versions of Shakespeare based on the quote, an army of monkeys in a room with typewriters, given enough time, will eventually type out the works of Shakespeare. I love the Fuji X cameras. I've been heavily involved in digital photography for the last 20 years, and I've lived through the transition from film-based photography to digital capture. The current era of photography technology is better than ever, but we must acknowledge that we stand on the shoulders of giants. Fujifilm understands this, and I feel that the Fuji X cameras represent the perfect marriage of the best aspects of the photo tools of the past, blended with leading edge imaging technology. This is currently my go-to camera, the X-T1, at least while I'm waiting for the X-Pro2. I'm also using an X-E2 that I had converted into infrared capture, and we'll be looking at some images created with this camera. Today I'm going to be talking about creative imaging techniques with Fuji X cameras. Specifically, I'm going to share my techniques for shooting and processing panoramas. The joys of shooting panoramas are many and I'm surprised that many people do not use this option more often. First, the panorama process allows you to shoot very wide vistas. Because you can shoot wider than you normally could, you can also shoot closer. 
you have the benefit of expanded resolution which, with much finer detail than a single shot could contain. Panoramas are also great for the animation of stills and video. Here's a classic application of the panorama process. This image was shot with my go-to zoom lens, an 18 to 135 millimeter on my Fuji X-T1, at the widest 18 millimeter setting. The ends of the building are covered by trees. When I move in to get a more unobstructed view, my lens is just not wide enough. So the solution is to shoot multiple shots, panning the camera so that each individual shot overlaps at least 35% with the next shot. 50% is a little better. Ideally, you would use a tripod, but I no longer want to carry around tripods. The Fuji X-T1 is 40% lighter than an equivalent DSLR, and I enjoy the portability. So I've developed a technique that works really well for hand-holding the panel shots. The key is to pivot over your front foot rather than twist at your waist to pan across the screen. Pivoting over your foot, which ideally will be under the camera in a normal vertical grip, keeps the camera twisting around its center and makes the assembly of the panorama more accurate. Later in Photoshop or Lightroom, the multiple shots can be blended into a final panorama that can cover a wider field of view than any wide-angle lens by itself. The most convenient way to process panoramas is right in Lightroom. Simply select the multiple panning shots and select Photo Merge under the Photo menu. The resulting preview shows you what the default projection will look like. When the Auto Select Projection checkbox is checked, you'll almost always get spherical projection. This is good for the majority of panoramas. But for architectural shots like this, I prefer to use cylindrical. Simply click on the cylindrical button as shown here. The vertical stretch a bit, and I think it makes for a better image. Pretty cool. There's no way I could have captured the whole building any other way. So we can see how it is easy to shoot an extremely wide scene, but this also means we can shoot a scene that does not give us the option to back up for a wider view as well. In this situation, for an architectural tour, this particular scene had my back up against a wall. I didn't have a wide enough lens with me, but no problem. I just shot a couple of vertical shots for a panorama, getting the top of the building and extra coverage on the sides. One of the issues with spherical projection is that horizontal lines get curved, making the building seem like it's bowing out. Cylindrical stretches out the verticals, but it doesn't do anything for the curved horizontals. Perspective is the projection of choice here and pushes the center back with nice straight horizontal lines. Here's the final image. One word of caution though, with perspective projection, you usually get a lot of width distortion at the sides of the image, and any people in the shot will look fat. The real estate agent did not like the way she looked in this image, so bear that in mind. If the subject has a lot of curved lines in it, spherical projection can work great, even if it is architectural in nature. This particular scene actually benefits by the wide angle effect of spherical projection. Here's a panorama captured with my infrared modified XE2. All shot, handheld, pivotal and over in my front foot. However, I was on uneven ground at the edge of a cliff, and I wasn't quite able to keep the camera twisting around its center. The resulting panorama displays a defect typical of non-centered panning. Here's the panorama. Uh, the final. Can you see the defect? The lines on the road don't line up. I had to go into Photoshop to do a little artful cloning to get things fixed up. Here's the final corrected version with a split tone treatment. As I mentioned before, because you can shoot wider than normal, you can shoot in situations where you are too close. Here I wasn't aiming for a wide vista or wide angle effect. I was simply too close to get the whole building in the shot. 
This was taken in Istanbul in an old section of town where the streets were very narrow, and my back was up against the wall. In the final shot, this building uh, is easily a couple hundred years old in all original construction. And now a couple thousand years old, Poseidon's temple outside of Athens, Greece. Again, my back was against a fence at the edge of the cliff. Three shots in this case, and there was no need to shoot vertical. And now we have perspective correction to keep the horizontal straight. Notice how distorted the people look. I don't really care because none of them are my traveling companions, and uh, they won't be seeing this shot. Here's a situation where I was too close and had to point up just to get the top of the Acropolis in Athens. Multiple panning shots at my widest setting, in this case a Fuji 10 to 24 millimeter at 10 millimeter, covering the whole scene from the base of the structure, which is maybe 15 feet from the nearest column. The result could not be done with perspective correction. It just simply failed and wouldn't work. But cylindrical projection did work, although there was nothing I could do to get the horizontals to straighten out. It's still kind of a cool shot. Spherical projection worked very well for these shots. I, I did these for a theater interior. Uh, and it, the spherical projection worked just because everything was, was really curved. This is the reverse angle shooting from the stage. It's a 180 degree field of view. That's pretty cool and I don't have a fisheye lens. This is an interesting panorama shot of the dome ceiling in the Pantheon in Rome. I shot with the Fuji X-Pro1 and the 18mm f2 prime lens. Here I was pointing up and spinning around trying to keep the ocular opening in more or less the same relative position in multiple frames. When I finally processed the image, it assembled the shot using spherical projection. Fantastic. Here's a similar shot, this time in the Baptistery di San Giovanni in Florence. I was standing in the center, looking straight up at the skylight, and spinning while I kept the skylight in the left edge, more or less in the same relative position. The resulting panorama is not without its flaws, but still pretty impressive considering it was shot handheld. The previous shot hinted at the animation possibilities of panoramas. Let's explore a few more examples. This panel was shot from the balcony of our hotel room in Istanbul, where we had an amazing view of the Hagia Sophia, the Byzantine church on the right, or on the left, say, rather, and the Blue Mosque on the right. It's a juxtaposition of two of the major religions, a perfect symbol for the city at the crossroads of the world. The animation was created from the panorama image, the, the single panorama image, I should say, animating a slow panning move across the image. Here's another one from Italy, this time in Positano on the Amalfi Coast. This is a very wide scene, impossible to get in just one shot. And the resulting images got fabulous detail everywhere. Here we return to Turkey, this time in Ephesus, an ancient Greek city in western Turkey. This panel was captured with my infrared XE2. This is a massive file, about 16,000 by 4,750 pixels. It's amazing. The amount of detail is just incredible. So you're taking the long dimension of the sensor and multiplying it widthwise uh, multiple times, and you just get an amazing amount of uh, information captured. Here's, this is the whole image. This is also uh, an infrared, infrared capture. Um, and here's a 100% view, one-to-one, -one, showing the level of detail captured by Fuji's X-Trans sensor. 
I bet you didn't see this guy in the center here as the pano went by. Here's another pano from Ephesus, this time the amphitheater. Ephesus is one of the best preserved ancient archaeological sites in the world. Now we come to Cappadocia, an amazing location in central Turkey where people carved their homes out of solid rock in ancient times. The area was popular with monastic Christian sects seeking refuge from the Roman persecution. Here's the whole shot. It's another one captured in infrared with the XE2. We weren't supposed to shoot photos inside the small altar rooms in this area, but the close quarters were a perfect subject for panoramas. This room was carved out of solid rock. Our hotel in Cappadocia was also carved out of solid rock. Here's a panel showing two of the rooms from the outside. And here's an interior of our room, also carved out of solid rock. An often overlooked aspect of panoramas is that they can be quite effective as verticals. Here we are in the Blue Mosque in Istanbul. And it's fairly dimly lit. Uh, this was fairly high ISO, but the multiple overlapping uh, individual shots allow me to capture an incredible amount of detail. The resulting tall vertical is kind of interesting in its own right. Here's another vertical pano. This one is captured in Topkapi Palace, the home of the Sultan, in the harem section. These uh, multi-shot panoramas and expanded resolution are perfect for capturing the amazing detail and present, in, present in these interiors. You can see this woman here is quite smart. She couldn't quite back up far enough, so she put her camera on the floor. I think uh, shooting the panos is the way to go with this, though. Here's another room in the harem section. Uh, the, the harem section was where the sultan's wives were. And this was easily the most decorated and uh, opulent area of the Topkapi Palace. Here, in this image, I had to use spherical projection, partly because I was so close to the left side, the rails here that are going by, and, um, and partly because on the right side, you'll see there are a lot more people, and they would have been seriously distorted. I actually uh, don't mind the, the, the sort of curved horizontals here. I think they add to the effect of the extreme wide angle. Now here's a fun thing that can happen when you're shooting panoramas. Here, right when I started shooting, one of our traveling companions entered the room. And uh, she walked around through the room, and, uh, sort of behind me and around me. By the time I got to the right side, there she was again. So she appears twice in the same shot. Evil twins. Another pano in the harem section. Multiple shots uh, overlapping. It's always better to overlap more than 35%, but certainly not less. So if you can go 50% overlap, you'll end up with a better uh, stitching job later on. So here's a, a spherical projection got curved horizontals. Here's cylindrical and then the stretched verticals, but the horizontals are still curved. And here's perspective, you know, and the, the curved horizontal straighten out. Now after you've stitched these things in Lightroom, you end up with a DNG file, a raw file that you can further edit as a single unit. 
and uh, here's the final after color and tone correction. Here's one final example to illustrate how you should always shoot for extra coverage on the sides of your panels. I didn't quite shoot enough coverage here in this one and when I finally get to my uh, projection choices here I can see uh, here's spherical, okay, cylindrical, and perspective, but I'm missing the fire hydrant in the corner of the building because I have the auto crop uh, checked as an option here. I uncheck the auto crop, it shows that I actually have the corner of the building, but the panel stitching process distorts the edges, kind of you can see how they're squashed in and there's all this extra white space. I decide to go with spherical because it seems to fit the curved parts of the building and leaves a little less blank white space to fill in. The final version required a bit of retouching to add back the hydrant and fill in the gaps in the sky and the ground. So our takeaway tips for shooting and processing panoramas. Shoot panoramas vertically so you can capture the widest field of view when you're mul shooting multiple shots. Choose spherical projection if people are present to avoid too much distortion. Uh, choose perspective projection if you need straight horizontal lines, especially with architectural shots. Shoot for extra coverage on the side so you don't in run into trouble when you have to crop. And plan on retouching in Photoshop as necessary because, you know, sometimes shit happens. Remember to try vertical panoramas. Well, thanks for watching. You might be interested in my last book, Mastering Exposure and the Zone System for Digital Photographers, or my best-selling book, Skin, The Complete Guide to Digitally Lighting, Photographing, and Retouching Faces and Bodies. Both books are available on Amazon. I have a very comprehensive course in photo illustration, compositing, and special effects in Photoshop, and it's available at courses.veris.com. I also have a great course on travel photography on Craftsy.com where I cover shooting panels as well as other topics related to travel photography. Please visit my blog at www.veris.com. Follow me on Twitter and check out my YouTube channel where I post free tutorials and other videos of interest to photographers. Thank you for watching and thank you to Fuji for their amazing cameras and other imaging tools.